I don't know what it's like in Japan, but here in the Northwest, particularly the United States, many patients are looking for natural remedies. So do you have patients that you see who you know, are, are interested in alternative therapies uh, for skull-based tumors or for anything else? Is that a phenomenon in Japan where you know, people want to take garlic and cloves and supplements and try to get around having surgery? No? Yes? Indifferent? OK. Well, it, it is a phenomenon here. And, and, and also, many patients are afraid of the idea of radiation. And, but, but there's nothing to fear because nothing is more natural than radiation. So since the dawn of time, we've all evolved in a soup of high-dose radiation. And you may not know it, but you all were exposed to very high-dose radiation this morning when you had breakfast and consumed this fruit. Did anyone have a banana today? Anybody? Okay, well, thank you. I did. And it turns out that bananas are very radioactive. Did anyone know that? I mean, in terms of fruits, relatively speaking, because they're high in potassium. And elemental potassium, K39, is the most common form of potassium in the universe. But equally distributed throughout the universe is K40, which is about 0.1% of all potassium in the universe, is a radioactive isotope of potassium. And it's, it's just interesting when we're thinking about radiation for tumors. It's interesting to think about what um, radiation dose we're giving and how that is couched in the universe of radiation. And one thing that's very interesting is that typically patients and people living within a nuclear power plant for a year receive some excessive radiation, about 0.1 microsievert over baseline. But what's more interesting is that people don't realize that people who live near a coal plant receive about three times that amount because of radioactive isotopes released during combustion. And all of that, though, is about the same scale of radiation that you receive by an extra dose of potassium, which gives you about 0.1 microsieverts of radiation all on its own. And so when people say, oh, you know, I don't want radiation, uh, there's, there's somewhat of a misconception that Things like bananas and even an airplane flight across the continental U.S. leads to fairly, you know, readily detectable measured doses above background on the order of 40 microsieverts. So even that airplane flying is dwarfed just by yearly potassium exposure in the body, about 400 microsieverts. Now, what's interesting is that orders of magnitude above that is so when Japan was involved in this earthquake disaster, which I'm sure you all really know, it's interesting to think about how much radiation radiation workers in particular were getting. And they were getting about 3.6 millisieverts over the course of the day. Now, I'm allowed to receive, um, so I'm allowed to receive 50 millisieverts. So in one day, they were getting about four to five millisieverts. So working in that environment for 10 days, they were hitting the maximum annual exposure level that was considered safe for, for radiation workers. So, so that's about 50 millisieverts. So life-threatening doses are about two sieverts, and we see fatal doses at about eight sieverts. And sieverts in gray are about interchangeable. And 8 to 10 gray is about the minimal dose that we use to treat skull-based tumors. Now, just to couch Japan and Chernobyl, 
At Chernobyl, the radiation disaster was so bad that anyone within a reasonable distance from the Chernobyl reactor was getting uh, 50 sieverts in 10 minutes. So many orders of magnitude of radiation more. So that's almost instantaneously fatal. Uh, so not much, much worse. Um, so I have some information here about radiation and, and how it works. Um, but I might just skip down to this. And so at this program and at our center, we do mostly stereotactic radiosurgery. And we do some fractionated stereotactic radiation. So we do some multi-fraction, but still very condensed radiation courses. And the idea behind this is very similar to that of a young boy or young girl on the sidewalk in the summer trying to light leaves or ants on fire, depending on their temperament, with a magnifying glass. So condensing ultraviolet radiation through a lens to a single focal point. And so that's, that's sort of the idea. here for stereotactic radio surgery is very similar. So we have a gamma knife and a cyber knife, and we do uh, all single fraction radio surgery with gamma knife. And so th this is a classic head frame of gamma knife, taking 200 gamma rays and making them coincident on a single focal point uh, in a patient who has a fixed head frame. And this is a picture of a gamma knife and one of their newer devices. Whereas with the cyber knife, patients don't have rigid immobilization. They're put in a mask, and there uh, is real-time orthogonal or cross-sectional imaging. Uh, and so in our program, we use the gamma knife for all of our stereotactic radio surgery, all single fraction. And for cyber knife, we can do single fraction, but we mostly do multi-fraction regimens. And we're, we're trying to take advantage of some radiobiology of this, and I won't, I won't really get into the details, but this is sort of a classic case of a CP angle tumor that we treat with gamma knife. And for benign lesions, single fraction, we'll treat in the range of 12 and a half to 14 gray, depending on the patient's specific scenario, what their uh, hearing level and speech discrimination is at baseline. Um, so this is an example of a gamma knife plan. You can see the CP angle tumor on the Fiesta image to the left of the screen and on the enhanced T1 image on the right. And the yellow line is the prescription isodose line for 12 and a half gray with gamma knife. The green line is the 6 gray line. And so we're striving. You can see we have this green contour in the region of the cochlea. So it, you can probably appreciate the fact that the green line is bowing in off of the, the cochlea. So we're doing our best to spare hearing. It's a very classic case, single fraction gamma knife. Do any of you have experience with gamma knife like this? Not so much. And <clears throat> this is an example of a patient with a large uh, sphenoid cavernous sinus meningioma. And this patient had an attempted surgery at an outside hospital and didn't do well, had some bleeding, and some stroke symptoms. And they came to us. And this is an example of a case that we would treat with multi-fraction radiation. So you can see here the optic chiasm in orange. Again, here you can see the optic nerve on the right coming back, contoured in yellow. And you can see that the prescription isodose lines fall off very sharply uh, across this gradient of tumor. And we keep a minimum dose of the optic nerves to 23 gray in five fractions. And we more or less try to drive this to 30 gray in five fractions. So perioptic tumors um, that are large, we tend to treat in five fractions with cyber knife. 
And you know, the, the thing about this kind of treatment is that this works. This is a, a series of hundreds of patients treated over 10 years uh, uh, among three large German centers. And you know, all of the curves when you're looking at CP angle lesions look like this with almost any form of radiation. We think that the single fraction of radio surgery is probably the most expedient, but you know, this is local control and it 10 years it drops as low as 94% and then is fairly stable. So, you know, very good treatment for CP angle tumors. Uh, similarly, there are multiple series of these perioptic lesions treated with fractionated radiosurgery. This is one from Stanford, 50 patients um, treated with two to five fractions. They really like a two fraction regimen, which is 10 gray times two. And at about five years, they see about the same, you know, mid-90s local control, and you know, generally stable to somewhat improved vision. So, pretty good results. So, if, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to bring you downstairs and show you our gamma knife and our cyber knife, uh, and answer any questions that you have. Mm -hmm.